Hey all, this is Ron K. Armstrong, filmmaker extraordinaire with another broadcast for you. And as you know, I always try to have interesting guests, filmmakers, actors, artists, extraordinaire. And today I have a treat for you. I have Ralph Scott, filmmaker Ralph Scott. And this gentleman has been in the industry for a long time. He has a lot of knowledge that he's going to impart to us. But just to give you a little bit of background um, on him, he's been, the last 25 years, basically, he's been promoting films. Um, he's been the program director and co-founder of the Black Hollywood Education and Resource Center. And he has a new film called Barbara's All. He's going to talk about that. And also, we're going to talk about the industry and some really exciting things. So um, welcome, Ralph. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine, barring all technical uh, issues. As you know, in filmmaking, you got to deal with that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you know, I realize it's a new era because um, I remember before when I, when I was starting out, I remember, I don't know if you remember the Black Filmmaker Foundation, and uh, that was really the only way black filmers could connect back then. And we didn't have the internet, we didn't have all this uh, digital exactly. filmmaking and all that. So everything is so new now and we can just connect and bridge the gap. Yeah. But, um, tell us about you know this, this idea, because I've heard you know about the uh, Black Hollywood Education Resource Center, but I never knew much about it. Tell, tell us about it. Uh, BATRC was founded many years ago in Los Angeles. Well, before we uh, uh, opened BATRC, we did films through the NAACP um, in Los Angeles in the Beverly Hills Hollywood chapter. That's the same chapter that holds that used to hold the uh, the Image Awards. Mm. And so uh, Sandra Evers Manley was the president of the chapter then, and she wanted to showcase short films. And at that same time, I had just landed in Los Angeles, and I came to I don't know how I guess you know God intervention somehow I ended up at that showcase and uh, saw the short films and I got it. I got how the short films was different than what the mass market was putting out. At that time, New Jack City had just come out. Uh, I think uh, a little while after that, Boys in the Hood came out. So there was, a, if you remember that time, there was a certain type of film that was being portrayed in the mass market. And the short films were very different than the mass market. And we realized really soon that that was the life and bread of the black filmmaker movement. So we developed a short film uh, film festival back then, and we and it's still going on strong. I think we just had our 20, 26 year. I forget how many years. 27, 26, I don't know. One of those years. Um, anniversary and. Uh, you know, but we've only shown, we, we may show some features as a special to the uh, festival kickoff or something like that, but we really focus on the independent short film because that, like I said, is the life bread of the independent filmmaker movement. You know, it's funny, now it's coming back to me. I think I had a film that I submitted years ago and uh -oh. it was like second place. <laughs> oh, okay, good, good. Yeah, I was like, you know, why does this sound so familiar? You know what I mean? Yeah, so, you know, you, you brought up a good point about how um, the genre, I shouldn't say genre, but how the films have changed since New Jack City to now. Um, talk about that. Like, what, what have you noticed different in terms of the way black filmmakers are coming up with stories? And, and what, what are they, what, what's now like the dominant storyline that's out there? I think that the storylines go uh, by the way of the times. I mean, uh, you don't need much of a memory to know that uh, when Tyler Perry was doing his um, play to theater type films, there was a few of those that came out there. Uh, then you have the films that are uh, an ensemble cast, you know, like the, um, uh, oh gosh, what's the name of the Steve Harvey book? I can't think of the name of it. Is that the relationship book you mean? The uh... Yeah, the, basically. So, there's, you know, there's, then there's the plethora of the relationship-based ensemble character films. And then you have, of course, now um, 12 Years a Slave was successful. Uh, Django uh, uh, Unchained was successful. So then you had a few, but well, not a lot, a few uh, slave narrative films. So, you know, it just depends on what gets popular. You know, like I said, when Boys in the Hood came out, you know, you couldn't get enough of seeing ghetto gangster guys getting shot up on screen. Yeah. 
It was interesting because I went to a screening of Boys in the Hood and actually sat next to John Singleton. (laughs) I didn't realize it until they introduced me to him. I was like, oh, okay. The good thing you didn't say anything like, oh, man, who's that that corny uh, post office guy? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Tell me, like, because you said you you were working on promoting. So say I make a short film. What's the best way to promote that? Oh, it broke up a little bit. I suppose you said the best way to promote your film. Yeah. It's funny. I was just talking to somebody on the phone today. Uh, a young lady uh, wrote a book 10 years ago, and um, she got invited to, there's a film festival in Atlanta. I, can't, I wish I had thought of the name of it. But anyway, and she won, uh, she not won, but she's getting uh, uh, runner up, basically. And she's like, well, what do I do? I've never done this before. And I said, well, basically, you have to use this moment. This film festival is set up for you to promote yourself as whatever you say you are. So if you want to be a writer, then make a make business cards, make flyers, uh, make sure you are meeting the people at that film festival as a writer or as a filmmaker or as a lighting technician or whatever it is that you want to claim your fame to be, use those film festivals to open up those doors because that's, the film festival is where you will meet and greet the people of the industry. You never, 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 never know who's sitting in that audience. Like you said, Singleton was sitting right next to you. Yeah. You know, what if you guys had chatted a little bit, hey, you know, I kind of made a little film. Oh yeah, well, you know, you should shoot it to me. Okay, well, now let me have your stuff. You shot it to him, he's like, you know what? I've been thinking about a project like this, man. If you have a feature script, let's make it happen. Mm. And then boom, without agents, without managers, without all of the rigmarole. So uh, film festivals are a great way to promote yourself as a film, as a filmmaker, as a first steps anyway. You know, I recall back then um, it was kind of like, okay, or kind of cool to be known as a black filmmaker. Do you think that that stigma today can hurt you and put place you in a box as far as Hollywood is concerned? Uh, no, not these days, because now um, there's a whole new arm. You know, you have the, the Netflix, you have the Hulus, and you have the, uh, uh, you know, we've got wonderful shows that are happening on HBO now. Um, we have a broader um, base, so to speak. You know, you don't just have to go either DVD and big screen. You can go DVD, big screen, Hulu, Netflix. Um, I heard Verizon's now doing Go90. Look that up. I just heard about that today. Um, So uh, I say, I mean, Atlanta. I mean, I didn't, I had no idea where this guy came from (laughs) before Atlanta. I mean, I may be in the dark ages. I don't know. But all of a sudden, <laughs> this guy's in Atlanta. I watch Atlanta. I'm like, this is phenomenal. Where did this guy come from? How did he get from I never heard of him to Atlanta and he's winning awards and the Emmys, et cetera? So, wow. you know, the doors are open. It's just, it's still a trick getting in. It's still a little bit of a trick. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to work at William Morris and uh, I saw there. Um, where it's a game of who you know, right? It's a little bit of what you know. I mean, what you know is good after you get in the door. But to get in the door is, is really, really based on who you know. And uh, like I said, if you sit next to, if you don't know John Singleton, if you happen to be sitting next to him and you said something that he likes, he can get you in the door, mm. maybe. You know what I mean? On a door that he's trying to get in himself. So it might be just some point of, uh, you had something that he could, you know, work with. What, what do you What do you think about? I mean, if you would, if you were to look at talent making a great mm-hmm. film, and the the racism in the industry, do you think that that is a racism prevents individuals, you know, black filmmakers from achieving um, any type of status or or you know, like getting deals? Um. That's such a heavy uh, topic, right? Um, but it's, it's a two-faced issue, right? So again, William Morris, right? I was in a meeting and uh, it, it was amazing because I sat in a room with a lit agent, uh, a director's agent, and, and a producer's agent, and they just wanted, they had some scripts on the table that they just wanted to get out the door and done, right? And so they were going through this stack of scripts and they were like, let's say, okay, here's a cowboy flick, right? 
uh, we need a female lead, we need a male lead, and we need an older male gentleman uh, co-lead, co right? So they said, okay, how about so-and-so for the female? Uh, who do you got? Oh, this female or this guy is trying to do something with, uh, he kind of likes um, cowboy flicks. Uh, okay, so what about the older male? And one guy threw out the name Morgan Freeman, right? We all know Morgan Freeman. That would be a good, and they all said, oh, yeah, Morgan Freeman. Then the agent said, well, he's black. He won't sell in the foreign market. Mm. Right? Okay, so that's racist. I mean, by any count, I mean, it's money on the line, but it's still because if that same lead was Will Smith, he wouldn't have made that statement. Yeah. You understand what I mean? So yeah. on one hand, it's racist, but on the other hand, it's about money. So yeah. if Will Smith, if the agent said, okay, I could get Will Smith for this, for this cowboy picture, that'll, it'll be done. I, I guarantee it wouldn't have been that same out, outline uh, output, basically. Mm. So it's a balance. So they can be racist when they want to be, or they can be, or they can look behind the curtain when it looks like money's going to come in. Mm. Now, this it's may be tricky. like, yeah, this, this may be like along the same lines or kind of the same question in a different way. But, you know, when I, when I, I I've gone around the country to a lot of filmmakers and I, uh, film festivals, and I've seen a lot of filmmakers, but I don't you know, there are a lot of filmmakers and then don't seem to be getting in that door. I mean, is it because of various reasons? Because there are good films out there and good ideas mm -hmm. out there, you know? Um, again, that goes back to that double-edged sword because, okay, so I always tell this analogy. I don't know how far my hands can go. All right, so this is the mass market. Every film you can imagine is in the mass market, right? This is the audience of the mass market, I should say. So if you have a film that's going to reach as many of these people as possible, you're in. So we're talking about Jaws. We're talking, I'm trying to think of, you know, mass market films that everybody goes to see. Um, whatever you want to put in that box, right? So the people in that film, there's a range. Usually it's white, male, and then they just put out a report that, you know, white women aren't necessarily getting the roles that they, they, they think that they're going to get. But anyway, so in this mass market, you're going to get a white male superhero type uh, uh, protagonist, and it's a blockbuster film. So think about it this way, and then say, okay, well, I'm now going to make it a black film. So all the people that would have seen this film probably would shrink down to here, right? Yeah. And this is still like a superhero. I mean, we're talking, so let's see what happens when Black Panther comes out. Now, that might push the arc a little bit, but it, I don't know if it's going to go back out to here. So that's the challenge. So how do we get here when you have this kind of potential? Isn't that due to marketing campaign? Because, you know, Hollywood all produces duds, but they spend tons of millions of dollars in marketing, you know, and they know sometimes the film stinks, but they still invest that much in marketing anyway. It's their dollar game. I mean, it's, you know, um, there are so many films that are duds that they put, you know, a lot, a lot of them. I mean, look at the, what's the franchise I just saw a little bit today uh, where they go to, to Las Vegas and they rip off the hotel, uh, the 12. Uh, Ocean 11, Ocean 12. Yeah, 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 yeah. They have. So if you look at that movie, there's so much money in those movies, right? It's almost set up. It's like they don't even care what the content is in the movie. They're just going to throw all these actors in the movie, blow up some stuff, and you buy your popcorn, you go home, and you feel a little bit satisfied. I mean, is, is it going to win an Academy Award? Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But are they going to do that to a, a quote-unquote black film? Mm -hmm because again go back to that to that meeting will the black film sell in the, in the foreign market you and I might have an argument and say yeah it should sell in the foreign market I mean what's the big difference right yeah, yeah. but it's all about the relationship between the distributors and the exhibitors and you know the people who are marketing in these foreign markets mm. so there's a lot of uh, entities that have to come together for that to work and if those entities don't really, as soon as you put up a poster that has a black face on it, like, uh, give me that other one. Give me that other one. Do you remember the film uh, um, Dur uh, Dirty Pretty Things, I think it was called? Dirty. Yeah, I, th I think I know what you're talking about. 
Yeah, so they had a poster. <clears throat> there were, there, um, Chiwetel Ejiofor was the black uh, co-lead. And I forget the young lady she played in Amelie. And basically he is, the, well actually he was the lead. She was the co-lead, if, if to tell the truth when you see the film. Um, but they were a love interest at one point in the film. So the poster had her, I forgot either, she was leaning on his back or they were together in the mm -hmm. poster. And if you look it up, you'll see there's a difference and there's a big boo-ha-ha -ha about it. Uh, but when the film started to come out, they pulled them apart, made it look more ominous and tried to sell it that way. Put her, I think they put her as the lead in the poster and he's like in the background kind of looking. <laughs> um, yeah. I forget, I gotta look it up. If you look it up right now, if you look up uh, Dirty Pretty Things uh, poster yeah. controversy, you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, one of, one of the, uh, the, the filmmakers I like is Steven Salzberg, right? So he just did, he did originally years, years ago, Sex Lies. Uh oh, you broke up. Say that again. Oh, one of the, the, the director filmmakers I like is Steven uh -oh. Salzberg, and he did Wait Sex Lies and Video. Hold on. Hold on. It's it jiggied up a little bit. Okay, oh. try it again. Oh, okay. Um, Steven Salzberg, you familiar with gotcha. him? Okay, yeah. so years ago he, he, he broke into the industry by doing Sex Lies and Videotape, right? Right, right, and, right. Um, so he he stepped out of directing for a long time because he was unhappy with the Hollywood system. And he just announced that he's kind of found this new way to get films financed and have total creative freedom, which is what he wants to do is basically do pre-sales. He wants to pre-sell um, the foreign rights and then keep some of the domestic rights for like what you were saying, like, you know, like, I guess, uh, Netflix and things of that nature. Okay. But what that would allow him to do is to um, control the accounting, you know, no creative accounting, keep uh -huh. most of the profits. Do you think that would work as, as what you just said with black filmmakers to do foreign pre-sales? But then again, okay, that goes back to the exhibitors. Okay, we used to say he, um, uh, distribution is the key, right? to anything that you're trying to do. But then I flipped the script and I used to say, exhibition is the door. If distribution is the key, you need your exhibitors. So yeah. um, if you don't have relationship with those exhibitors, you're, you're in bad shape. Mm. You know what I mean? So it depends if your distributor is going to, you know, um, uh, try and get those, gain those relationships. But if you're savvy, if you're smart, then maybe you would deal with the markets. There are certain markets that you can deal with that are uh, quote unquote black friendly. You know, I'm sure Paris and London and some other places might be, you know, the big Nigeria. cities. Yeah. Nigeria, of course, Nigeria. But you know, they're bucking the whole market anyway. If you follow their market, you might be able to get somewhere. Oh yeah. Their model, I should say. They have a model that, that you know, a Nollywood is, much much larger than Hollywood by in standards of films produced. Mm. Would you recommend going like two case studies that I want to mention is I'm not sure if you're familiar with Tariq Nasheed mm. and Ava DuVernay. Um, yeah, Ava DuVernay her, yeah. her first film and Tariq Nasheed they did Four Wall. What do you think about that? Well, that's something I've always been interested in. Um, uh, Ava DuVernay developed uh, before she had this, uh, I forgot the name of her movement now. Oh gosh, you'll kill me. But anyway, I forget the name of it. But she had another film distribution arm that linked with, um, I think it was AMC Theaters. And uh, they had uh, a deal where you can four wall in some AMC theaters across the country. And so she wow. took advantage of that and, and four walled some, you know, and so she would feed the films that she controlled into that pipeline. And then uh, you were able to do some things there. Um, there's something to be said about that because I've always said that uh, I'm, I'm very keen on the micro, what we call the micro cinema, you know, doing the film festivals and the film showcases is one thing, but micro cinema is where in a town you have some people that go to a local bar, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they turn all the flat screen TVs to a certain dire direction, they turn it all up and it's Wednesday night and it's, you know, it's film night. And uh, I think that might have died down a little bit. I don't see it as yeah, much. Yeah, it used to be very popular. Yeah, it used to be. It used to be, and you know, there was a guy in New York who has since passed. There was a guy in North Carolina who has since passed. There was a guy in Los Angeles who has since passed. Um, all good friends of mine, but um, I'm glad I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but there was something to that. Those were very special events. And uh, now that we're talking about them, that might be something to uh, think about and consider. But anyway, um, those were very popular. So if you can imagine, once you know the urban world has their feature film that everybody really loved, the award-winning feature film that really is not going to do too well in the mass market, it could go to these different towns, you know, to New York, D.C., Chicago, to these micro cinemas and say, hey, look, on this night, instead of the micro cinema, let's take this film to a theater and uh, deal with it that way. So that could be very, very uh, successful, but you need a system where it can just keep going. You know, you know who did that very successfully? Uh, it wasn't a narrative film, but it was The Secret. And they actually got on Oprah um, because they, oh, did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they did these little small get togethers and they screened the secret. They talked about using that technique to to get financial prosperity and things like that. So that that, that worked really well. But t tell me this and just your opinion. Why? You know, you heard Jada Pickett call for black Hollywood, right? Because, you know, the whole Oscar so white thing. Right. Why, why haven't I know Robert Townsend at one point? Um, uh -oh. Wait a minute. Tried, broke up again. Oh, I know Robert Townsend at one point tried to put together a black Hollywood. Why is it that with, with I mean, now you have your Will Smiths, you have a Idris, uh, Idris Elba's, you have, um, you know, a lot of black actors and Eddie Murphy's. Why haven't we started a, 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 a black studio? Hmm. There might be a level of fear there. I would think, I mean, I can't speak for those actors or those people in the, those high power positions, but I mean, you know, Oprah stepped out there with her, with her network, right? And in her own way, she's kind of doing what we're talking about. Uh, but, you know, get her in the room and talk to her about it. I'm sure, you know, she's had many sleepless nights and pulling her hair out and losing mm -hmm. money. I remember when she first uh, launched, she was losing a lot of money. Oh, and, wow. uh, and I think, I don't know if it's turning around now or not, but I think it's at least, you know, considered successful because they have that uh, Ava DuVernay show on now everybody likes. Yeah. But I haven't seen, I hate to say I haven't seen it, but uh, uh, so to that degree, yes, that can work. Now in a major, major way, I mean, it would have to be such a shift. It would have to be such a... You, you don't have, you shouldn't consider it the Hollywood system. You know what I mean? You would almost have to consider it something like, like, you know how we were just talking about Nollywood has a completely mm -hmm. different system. It would have to be something so completely different that you're just on your own lane and if I they agree. come to it, they come to it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's probably uh, what, what's probably hampering us because we were thinking in terms of, because Hollywood is very, it's big, it's multi-billion dollar industry and and I think people are thinking well we don't have that kind of capital and and we're not backed by Wall Street we don't have bankers to finance five pictures and things of that nature right. but you don't have to start out on that level you can start out sort of um, small and then and work your way up uh, I'll give you an example um, have you heard of uh, black and sexy TV no I saw you move all night in here oh no <laughs> I said no, oh, okay, no. All right, so. So this is one you should write down and, and put a link to at some point. Black and Sexy TV. Um, uh, uh, Dennis Dortch, uh, many years back, made a film called it's a, uh, it's a Good Day to Be Black and Sexy, right? And it's a, a film, a vignette film. So there's multiple stories in one film. But it's very different from what you and I are, are normally seeing in, like we said earlier, the... Uh, rom-com with the uh, ensemble cast. There are people you don't know, but uh, very familiar and very sexy scenarios, right? So it won, uh, I forgot what um, it won at Sundance, but it was a Sundance sweetheart a few years back. And uh, the studio that picked it up for distribution kind of did them a little dirty. They said they were gonna put it out um, in the theaters. They didn't really do that, pretty much straight to DVD. That's it, right? Yeah, yeah. So he, what he did was, since it was vignettes, he started breaking them up and showing the smaller pieces of A Good Day to Be Black and Sexy online. And uh, I, mean, I might not have the story exactly right, but then what he started doing, because he already had a crew of people, he's very creative, they started shooting different 
uh, storylines, just very small, cute little storylines, maybe 15 minutes each, whatever. But you get very engaged. You want to see the next one. You eventually, lo and behold, you got to sign up to Good Day, Good Day to Be Black and Sexy. And uh, they have uh, they have their own empire, so to speak, at this point. Wow. Right? And one of the things that came out of their camp is Insecure. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, now, I don't want to profess to know exactly how that worked out, but I know that they are of the same world. Mm -hmm. uh, Insecure, the young lady, she started doing her own, uh, you know, her web series, and that got picked up by HBO. But she's of that same crew, so to speak. Yeah, Issa Rae. Yeah. Yeah. What, what so that's, that's a completely different way to do it. You know, yeah. a lot of people have been trying to do the web series thing, but it's almost like they turn their back on, I'm doing the web series so I can get picked up for X, Y, Z. I'm doing the web series because I'm doing the web series. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? That's a different frame of thought instead of like, you know, I'm tap dancing so, you know, master can put me in the big house. <laughs> no, I'm tap dancing because my people like the way I tap dance. Yeah, yeah. That's so, the difference, you know what I mean? So speaking on that. <laughs> uh oh, it broke up again. What? Oh, speaking on that, can you hear me? Uh, it's it's coming back around. Okay, now try it. Okay, speaking on that, what do you think um, is uh, this? What do you think about the success of Tyler Perry? Um, I'm I'm happy for him now because you know Tyler Perry was just on the other night, and I've always said that um, as soon as he hangs up that dress, he's going to have a problem. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. You love it or hate it, as soon as he hangs up that dress, you know, there's going to be, I, in my opinion, that, you know, um, I tried to watch a film he was in where he's Tyler Perry as the Tyler Perry actor. You know, I don't know if I was able to buy it because he didn't come through the, <clears throat> the ranks of, you know, everybody else who's now going to be a, uh, um, a lead in a, in a feature film. So, um, does he hire a lot of people? I'm sure. Uh, does he have a stronghold on his segment of, uh, of the film population? I'm sure. I don't know if it's, it's weakening, um, but that can only be a good thing. That can only be a good thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, I mean? yeah, I'm just wondering, like, because he kind of represents um, something that we are trying to do, meaning he built his own studio and he has right. deals with networks. I mean, I'm just wondering, like, how did what what was what was it about him that afforded him all these opportunities to do that <laughs> <laughs> he was cuz if you remember he was doing those plays mm -hmm. all around the country and people were lining up around the block and and I'm pretty sure and I don't know the story but I can imagine somebody like I said you never know who's sitting next to you in the theater somebody uh witnessed this and said, hey, you know what? You need to come meet with me in my office Monday morning at one of these agent, you know, and I'm sure with, you know, now that he's ready to take that moment and he has the spit and the fire to take that moment and, and go with it, that's what happened, you know? As soon as they opened that door, he was like, okay, this is what we're gonna do, boom. So he had his audience. Oh, okay. Yeah, he had the audience. He had the audience already, right? Well, you know, I don't know how big yeah. it was, but he had, a, he had a nice big audience. And so if you're smart enough in the industry to know that uh, you take that audience and flip it into an act. I mean, the same thing with um, on a different level, like the Eddie Murphys and the Richard Pryors. They had a pretty good audience going from theater to theater, right? Comedy theater, Las Vegas, comedy theater, Los That's Angeles. Cool, yeah. Yeah. Right. But somebody said, hey, we can make a whole lot more money if we put that in all theaters at the same time. And the rest is history. Yeah, that's true. So it takes a little bit of both. Like I said, you know, on one hand, you know, if you went to pitch, if Richard Pryor went to pitch and said, hey, you know, I think you should film me for a uh, theatrical release. Right. And not really doing his legwork. Mm -hmm. like. Ninja, please, right, <laughs> right? But now that he's done the late work and someone got it and they said, okay, hey, let's come to my office on Monday morning, we'll talk about it and the rest is history.
What, what's your take on crowd, uh, crowdfunding? Well, being that I'm in crowdfunding right now, I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in crowdfunding as we speak on a different level. I, for my film, Barbasol, I uh, use crowdfunding to raise funds to make my film. Um, and now I'm using um, crowdfunding to exhibit. I'm, I'm doing a showcase uh, for the Congressional, not for the, at, during the Congressional Black Caucus. I have a, um, a Black Lives Matter themed film showcase that I'm taking to the uh, Congressional Black Caucus that I'm crowdfunding so that I won't have to charge uh, for people to come and uh, attend. I want it to be free and open to oh, all uh, attendees. So crowdfunding is a great, great way to get the person who says, I want to do something to do it. You know, in my case, um, I went for years and years and years without making a film, you know, promoting films, doing film festivals, setting up programs, etc. And then when I finally decided uh, to make a film, I was able to do so without really waiting, you know, five or ten more years trying to find funding. Mm. You know what I mean? Not that it takes five or ten years, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Tell us about Barbazol, though. I, 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 so Barbazol, I understand it's a father and son story. Yeah, it's a father and son story that touches on dementia. My uh, father uh, succumbed to dementia in his lifetime. And so while he was going through that, it, you know, it, for those uh, people that have dealt with their loved ones going through dementia or any other uh, mental health issue, it's devastating because, you know, what other people see is not who you know and love, right? You know, if, um, or even the person that you see is not who you remember that you know and love. Because you can walk in a room and your own father won't recognize you and know who you are and probably curse you out, you know, and throw something at you, get you out the room. Yeah. And you, you can turn around and go to the bathroom and come back and he's like, hey, boy, where you been? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so I felt that it was a story that needed to be told to help others understand the process there's black male caregiver in the story and uh you know there's other people dealing with that and it's a kind of a story that we don't really talk about too too much mental health and uh in the black community so where, where are you i mean where are you at with the production i mean is it completed or yeah it's all done i, it, I shot it uh it, um it won at urban world uh, back in 2014 i think it was 2013 up here um uh, I, I took it to uh, Los Angeles, Paris, France, Italy. Oh, wow. It's yeah, it's been around. I'll, I'll send you a link so you can see it. Yeah, yeah. We'd like to definitely take a look at that because I know you were working on it for a while because I kept seeing it pop up, but I didn't know what stage you were at. So wh what did you shoot on? Uh, we shot with a Canon. Um, no, see, this is my DP question. See, now, <laughs> this is what I did. when, And this is a tip to filmmakers, right? You can sit in a box and say, okay, you know what? I don't really know uh, how to write a script. I don't really know how to shoot a camera. I don't really know how to X, Y, Z, right? But if you know somebody who does those things, bring them on board. So I brought on a good uh, director of photography, Eric Bronco. Uh, he was my DP. Kiara Jones was my producer. Uh, she, and she's the writer of the script. I wrote the story. She wrote the script. And uh, I just had a good core of people around me and made a, and banged out a nice little film. So don't try and do everything. I see, you know, through my many, many years of, of showcasing short films, I see so many filmmakers go down the road of, well, you know, I couldn't find uh, an actor, so I decided to act in. I couldn't find a producer, so I decided to produce in it. I, you know, I'm the director, the producer. And the main problem with, with theory, if you know the theories of directing and producing, and I always say this is that the director wants to blow up a car on set. The producer is going to say, I don't have that in the budget. <laughs> so if you're the director and a producer, who wins that argument? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you end up doing something crappy, like drawing a picture of a car and then setting it on fire. I don't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you, you end up being more creative, but you need someone to try and hash that stuff out with. You can't do every everything yourself. So that's what I decided to do. I decided to find everybody um, to work on my film. 
So you said you took a break from filmmaking for a, a long time, right? So this is like your return. This film is your return? No, this was my, Barbara saw was my very first and only film. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I didn't, through all the years, when I started way back, like I said, in the NAACP, uh, showcasing short films, we turned into BHRC. We were strictly, I was strictly a uh, program director, uh, running the organization with the short films and, uh, Showcase the films, and we moved on to. Uh, uh, I had a show for BETJ, and I had a show on BET, and then a show on Aspire, showcasing short films. Mm. And uh, I got to a point where, after all those shows have ended, I was like, wow, I've done everything in the whole industry of showcasing and promoting short films. I haven't made one yet. <laughs> so I made one. That reminds me, you remind me of Tarantino because he was talking about how he would watch these Kung Fu movies on 42nd Street and, and he would know, like, rent all these videos. And he said, you know what, I think I can make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, but I guess Tarantino, he followed that model. He, he surrounded himself with people who knew what they were doing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's so important. Do you think now that the digital revolution is here where, you know, we're shooting on Red One, the Scarlet and all that, that it's made things a lot easier for black filmmakers or is there more saturation of content in the market or making things more difficult? What do you think? Um, well, you know, easier, I guess, to a novice, hmm, how should I answer that one? I was gonna say it could be considered easier, but it's still the same, monster right you still have to have a good script you still have to find actors you still have to shoot you know get your shots and make your days and and all that but the part that's easier you don't have to lug around loads of film you don't have to process it and you know there's processes that are easier but you still have to do the part that that makes the difference you know no matter what you shoot on you can shoot on your iphone right you can consider that the easiest thing, but that might even be harder because you really have to, really have to know what you're doing to make a decent looking film. Yeah. You know, my friend Craig uh, Ross in LA, he shot a film on his iPhone. Um, waiting, I haven't seen it yet, but I remember he was promoting it. Mm. Now see you've that. seen a lot of films. You've been, you're a program director, you've seen these films come and go. Oh, yeah. Tell us. What, what, what is the, the, the number one Dang, mistake? it's breaking up again. <laughs> oh, darn. Tell us the number one mistake that independent filmmakers make. Okay. Uh, I have my own phrase, uh, just because you could doesn't mean you should. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So you probably agree. You've seen a film that you could tell they had the money, they had the budget, they had the beautiful scenery, they had the cameras, they have everything a filmmaker could want, right? But the film sucked. Yeah. <laughs> Just because you could doesn't mean you should. Somebody else probably should have, you know, pulled that guy's ear and said, um, let's not shoot just yet. Let's have a <laughs> rehearsal. Let's, you know, um, and, and by me going through a lot of that, watching films and dealing with filmmakers, I followed the rules of the things that they might not do. Like I had um, uh, a, a, a script reading. You know, you have your script. Yes, it's one yes. thing between you and your, your script writer. Yeah, well, it's great. But what about, has anybody read it? Has anybody, you know, sat around a table and read all the lines with the characters to see how it plays? How's the timing? How does it feel? And so we did that. And, you know, pre-production is key. What are your colors? What are things going to look like? What is the feel? You know, so there are things that you probably should. There's a person who calls himself a filmmaker that really should be a producer. Yeah, yeah. And producers are really good at getting stuff done, right? They can get, like I said, they can get the equipment. They can get the money. They can get you know, everything that's needed for a film, but they shouldn't be in charge of the film at all. <laughs> they should then step back and let the creative person come in and say, okay, this is how we're gonna handle it. Yeah. So, so that that's one of the main things that I see. Is, and they'll never see it that way because that particular person who's a producer feels very strongly that they can make it all happen and they'll do it again and again and again. And you've seen it done again and again and again. It's like, how does this guy keep making films? 
and I can't even get money to make my one film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, but you can't tell them that because that's just the nature of that business. But yeah. What about something so I've seen for me, a lot of films that I've seen, there's always been issues with sound. That's just, you know, what have I experienced? I think that if they had a proper sound mix or a good sound person on the crew, it would have avoided that, you know? Yeah, but you know what? We you know what I learned making my film that I never really imagined. We're so concerned as a filmmaker, you're so concerned with the visual, right? Mm -hmm. Is this the shot? Is this the da 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 da, right? And, and when he walks in, he's got to do this. And boom, boom, you're so concerned. The acting is the acting right. And then at the end of the day, right before you shoot, it's like, okay, can you hear him? Okay, great, let's go, right? So I realized that you should also consider the sound before you shoot. Yes. Not, not in that moment, but like, okay, when he walks through that door, do you want to hear the door? Do you want to hear his steps? Do yeah. you want to hear the, the cops driving by outside? So consider that now before we shoot so we can set it up that way as opposed to later. It's like, oh, man, now there's a helicopter outside. What are we going to do? It's like, well, if you know that there's going to be a helicopter outside, you can, like I knew there was um, lawnmowers and barking dogs. I used that to my advantage. You know what I mean? I let that be, oh, for a perfect example, I had to shoot in a, a real live uh, hospital. It was a nursing home. And in that nursing home, uh, we had one room, but the rest of the, the uh, nursing home was live. So if somebody is in the room next door and calls out, nurse, we got to keep rolling. And I said, well, you know what? You're going to hear that in a nursing home, right? Yeah. So let's use that to our advantage. You know what I mean? So you have to think about, in terms of sound, think about that stuff in advance and try and work it the best of your, if there's an air, if you're, if you're uh, working in the flight path of an air, airport, maybe they have to stop and listen to the airplane go by before you continue on. Yeah. It's yeah. part of your storyline. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, let's say, you know, let me ask you this. If I, um, you, you had mentioned like, um, festivals and stuff of that nature. You, do you think it's a good idea to go to these festivals? Because, you know, there, there's a certain um, perspective that, well, any good festivals, which are top tier like Sundance and Tribeca are very difficult to get in. And those are the ones you want to go to because they have the agents and producers that are there and the studios are there. But what about the, the second, third tier festivals? Do you think it's worth going to those or, or submitting your film to them? Um, yes, I think it's worth. Uh, it depends. I mean, it's it's a case by case scenario, of course, because you know it costs a lot of money to keep submitting your films to all these festivals and getting accepted. Um, but make a list again. Know what you want um, in the onset. Like for instance, when I made my film, of course, I wanted to showcase it at um, uh, ABFF. ABFF is an exclusive situation where you can't show your film anywhere else before you show at ABF if it wasn't quite ready. So I, I submitted it anyway. Just, you know, I just, why not? It's not quite ready, but submitted. It didn't get selected. So that almost like freed me up. It's like, okay, now I can go anywhere. So I was still working on it, got it ready for the Urban World, and it won Best Audience Film of that year. So um, be selective, but be open. You know what I mean? Because like I said, you never, never know who's sitting in that audience is going to see your film and say, hey, this guy has something, this girl has something that you know my agent or my manager or my producer's partners need to check out. You never, mm -hmm. never know. So just be open. I wouldn't, you know, if it's available and it feels right, go for it. Mm. Do you think there is um, a, a myopic um, perspective in the African American community on storylines? Do you think we focus too much on romance and hood stories? Um, you know, for the longest time, I've, uh, I've been critical of that because, um, you know, like I said, you know, when I started, uh, there was always the hood story and I was like, can we get away from the hood stories? Right. And then we went into the romance, like you say, the romance, uh, stories, which was fine. But, you know, one thing that we, we still shy away from is sci-fi. Sci 
he shy away from um, you know horror uh, horror the which which we you know now you're gonna see some I'm telling you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my words you're gonna see some <laughs> um, it's scary because online uh, somebody had a little parody um, get out two like you know this is a trailer for get out two and I was like what really and I was like, it was a joke but I was oh, like, oh wow I can't imagine what that's gonna be but um, you know what about you know what I would like to make? What's that? I would like to make a children's musical, uh, if not Christmas, a, a film about school, something like that. Something really simple and fun. And, you know, uh, because it's, in my opinion, musicals will, will span the test of time. I mean, you'll, a musical will last forever. They if will it's done rerun right. it. Yeah, if it's done right. Rerun it <laughs> ad infinitum. Right. So, but the trick is, it doesn't have to be what we consider a black film, right? Yeah. yeah. It can be just culturally enriching. It, it doesn't have to be, you know, all white. It doesn't have to be all black. But it can have a feeling that you're used to when you walk out the door in the morning. When you yes, go out the door, totally you don't just see one thing. You know, you have a natural uh, flow of things and. In my opinion, I feel that that would be a really good idea. Yeah, I always say that. Don't, you know, don't I'm, copy that, anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just gave it away now. <laughs> I always felt like, as a screenwriter, the way, as as an African American screenwriter, as the way that you get across your message should be universal. That that your characters, yes, they can be black, but the situations and scenarios should be where people, everybody, can identify with those things. You know, I sometimes feel that we. We, we, we culturally lock ourselves in a box, you know? Because yes, we want to we discuss cultural issues and deal with those issues, but I, I see too many times that Hollywood would take that and run with it, and, and we'll just have a million of those type of films and nothing like, I mean, for example, Black Panther to me is like, I'm surprised that that got made, you know? Right, right, right. And w what's gonna happen after that? It's gonna get bastardized in some way. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, it will. Um, you know, but there, a, a very good example of the type of world I would like to see on film is, uh, I wish I could think of the guy's name. He's a comedian, he's Indian, Aziz. Aziz? Uh, I can't think of his name. But Lena Waithe uh, just got uh, nominated for her writing of one of his episodes. He's on uh, Netflix. Uh -huh. uh, what is the name of the show? God, I can't think of it. But, um, his his film his film or his show style is as diverse as you can get in anything you've ever seen. Mm. He's Indian. He might um, in one episode he starts to date a black girl. On another episode, his best friend Lena Waithe is a, uh, a black lesbian girl. Uh, I mean, and they're best friends. I mean, they show this episode shows them meeting up every year for Thanksgiving since they were like 10 years old. So mm -hmm. the episode takes you like every, you know, like Thanksgiving 1971, Thanksgiving 1972, and they're buddies all the way up until when she decides to, you know, come out the closet to her mother and, you know, uh, she brings home the first uh, girlfriend to the dinner table. It's just very, very uh, diverse in every sense of the word. And, uh, that's the type of film that I think would, would should do well. They, they've already shown that diversity does better, but I don't know why Hollywood doesn't get it. It seems you like know, they just that is so true. You know, because I, I don't know, I don't know if you remember this, but I'm, I I remember this a time when you would turn on commercials and you would not see any diversity in the commercial. And then Al Sharpton started this whole thing on Madison Avenue, trying to get them to be more diverse. Finally, they did, and they saw their profits increase. So. I'm not sure why Hollywood's slow to jump on the bandwagon. You know, I don't get it either. I really don't because uh, it, there's a study that shows those black and white buddy cop shows, like the Eddie Murphy and and the Nick Nolte, and uh, you name whichever black and white buddy cop. You know the um, uh, oh, what was that? Danny Glover, Danny Glover and Mel Gibson. Danny Glover. Right, right. They said those do very well because. The, psycho the, the psychology behind it was, <clears throat> if you follow it, I don't know, you know, I kind of get it, what they're saying. The psychology behind it is, 
as soon as you see a black character on screen, you you can identify with him. You can feel at home. That's why he's the the cool dude. That's why he's always like the 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 grounded guy. He's never you know over the top. Well, he could be over the top, but I mean over the top in terms of. Um, like he's not the head of the organization or he's not the head of the police department. He's like the everyday guy with the white guy and they kind of buddy it through, you know, like King of Queens, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, right. King of Queens, that's a perfect example where they're on this equal playing field and those do very, very well based on that concept. I like that show. <laughs> I do. I love it. I love it. I you know, this it was interesting because you know I watched the other day, and uh, I, I, it's hard for me to watch films because I'm very, as a filmmaker, super critical. But I watched Wonder Woman, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the first half, I'm not going to give you spoiler alerts to anyone out there. You know, I'm not going to. I'm sorry, I'm not going to spoil anything for you. So there's no spoiler alerts here. But the first half of the film takes place, I guess, on the Amazonian island, right? And mm -hmm. the first thing I'm looking, I'm saying, okay, are there any black women here? Yeah, you know, that was the first thing that went I do that all the time. <laughs> you know? And then lo and behold, there were, right? And then okay. my mind moved to the next thing. Are they just as pretty as the other Amazons? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like darn, I'm, I'm terrible at watching these films because I'm so critical and everything. Were they just as pretty? Yeah, well, yeah, they had some that were. But there was, this, there was one um, woman and she was very strong, you know? Um, not as pretty as the rest, but very strong and fierce. And I wish she was just as pretty. I think that would have went a long way. But hey, I got to give him props for just, you know, yeah. being that diverse and, cast there. <laughs> and, then, and then there's the fine line of is it going to be dark skin pretty or light skin pretty? Yeah. Isn't you know it so I mean? complex? Yeah. <laughs> she, was dark I remember, she was dark skin. I remember, I remember when they cast Holly Berry as Storm for the X Men series. And, uh, you know, I didn't read the comic book, but I watched the, the cartoon sometimes. And I was like, it feels like Storm should be like, you know, you know, Serena Williams or something. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Storm. Right. I mean, her name is Storm. And here you got Holly Berry. I mean, you could break her with a break her in half with a stick. Yeah, I thought that was bad casting. I mean, I love Holly Berry. I just thought that was not the right role for you. Yeah. It should have been somebody that my name is Storm. Yeah, presence and uh, you def I definitely think because she's supposed to be from Africa, you know. So I'm thinking yeah. she wouldn't look like that, you know. <laughs> look like that. So you know, the, the, that goes back to that. Like we said, you know, are you going to go after something because it's a racial thing, or is it because of the finance? And I think Holly Berry had to do with the finance. She was a name actress at the time. Yeah. And um, who else are you going to put in there besides Holly Berry? Do you think we're making progress in terms of getting better roles? Ooh, better. Hmm. Because you know Denzel won for Training Day, but he won because he's a bad guy. The Oscar, you know. I mean, and that was a few years ago. I'm trying yeah. to think of what's even with the onslaught of things that's been happening lately, which is all on television. Um, that's where the only better roles have been is on. The cable outlets yeah. yeah i noticed that too like nick cage and you know like yeah all of that stuff i mean um you know there's this we're watching claws now uh c-l-a-w-s with mm -hmm. um i'm bad at names tonight but it's a female driven crime um you know like uh you know how um <clears throat> Breaking Bad was a hapless guy who happened to get into this whole drug infested yeah. world. Same kind of thing with Claws. You have this hapless woman who's, she's not down on her luck, but she's trying to make her way through. And so she does some, some unscrupulous activity and it gets, keeps getting deeper and darker and deeper and darker. So yeah. it's the same kind of thing. So, uh, you know, those are roles that we didn't really see, you know, too often. Uh, you know, because she's not, um, well, she's not a prostitute, but I mean, you know, she might yeah. do some things that could be, could be borderline, but, you know, um, but she is at least in control of her own destiny, put it that way. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, so, yeah, I'd say they're coming, the, the feature film market, you know, unless you're doing a Moonlight, or unless, which, you know, that's another uh, mystery. How did, you know, how did that get, to the level it got. 
I think it was good. Maybe, from what I understand, I haven't seen it, but I've heard it was really good filmmaking. You know, it is. All but right. they, we, we've seen good films. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And all the people in that film were dark skinned. Oh, okay. <laughs> I okay. mean, I'm not making a point by that, but I'm just saying you can't get no darker than Moonlight. Yeah. Uh, it, and the the you know, where I'm going with that. Um, and, and it's a gay. It's not a gay themed film. It just you know. It, it has uh, gay characteristics. If, I don't know how best to put it without having people write you at the bottom down here. <laughs> I'm not bashing anybody. I'm just saying that you know the storyline yeah. has a gay theme to it. You know, there's yeah. no, there's never, there's never a right way to say it without getting in trouble. So you know, you just gotta see what you feel. Um, so yeah, that one's another um, mystery. Just like when um, Barbershop, the first Barbershop came out. That was almost a mystery because that was, remember we had the analogy of the blockbuster movie? Mm -hmm. That was pushing the envelope because a lot of people went to go see Barbershop that we didn't anticipate going to see it. Yeah. It was ringing the, it was ringing the bell. Um, you know, Barbershop was number one, da da da, da. Um, The box office was, was, you know, that's why they made Barbershop 2, which really stunk. <laughs> In my opinion. <laughs> well, you know, I'll be honest with you. I didn't think we would go see Get Out. You know, I thought that would just be like maybe if it, at best a sleeper hit, you know, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't see it early on. I saw it after the hype, unfortunately. But uh, but yeah, that's another one of the uh, uh, anomalies. Is that the word? Yeah, it was It was yeah. really, uh, I, I mean, I, I saw it and I thought, okay, you know, it's all right. But yeah, I was like, but people love it. It kept growing and growing, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And I think, you know, do I think what it was about that, I could be wrong, but when I was watching Get Out, I didn't get the sense it was an exclusive culturally black thing, even though it was in a way, but it had, it, it kind of like gave everyone a, 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 a peep into our world, you know what I mean? Yes, to a degree, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I think that, It that begged that question, you know, it's like, it's almost like a running joke. It's like, okay. What happens when you have a white girlfriend and she takes you out to meet her parents out in the country in Hicksville, yeah. you know? And it's like, okay, this is what can, it's like a Saturday Night Live skit. Okay, this is what can possibly happen. And, and, exactly. it went, so. and it's funny because you, when you mentioned um, the, 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 you know, cause I think now I'm hearing a lot of filmmakers and, and actors and just in the dating scene, everything is, is very color conscious, right? And everybody's mm -hmm. talking about, well, you know, it's the dark skin that is now in the light skin. <laughs> light skin's around, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm more, more, where's he been? I'm like, well, why do we have to have either way? You know, what is this? We can't just socially accept whatever there is now, you know, so. But you know, um, you know, it's been great talking to you. In closing, I just want to say, could you have any advice for filmmakers? Um, okay, well, I'll reiterate: make sure you uh, surround yourself with people who know what they're doing. Don't argue with them too, too much. Um, just really quick, like when I was shooting Barbasol, and you know, you know, you want your shot to be a certain way, and I let it go. My DP set up the shot. He says, "How this look?" I said, "That looks great. Let's go." And you can move along really quick. So um, uh, get out of your own way, basically, is, is really the moral to that story. Mm. And, uh, and uh, you can do it. You can do it. You know, just trust in your own vision and, and, uh, and put one foot in front of the other. You can do it. Now, are you helping to promote films? Can they, how can they contact you? Do you assist with promoting films? Or Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, for now, um, I have a company called Social Cinema, and what I'm doing in uh, the Congressional Black Caucus is called the Social Cinema Project. So the films that I'm showing is a form of promotion. I'm showing films made by people that have expressed uh, issues uh, in social justice and uh, uh, either in um, documentary form or narrative form. Um, I'm doing short films, but I have some feature films in my repertoire that depends on the scenario. Cause I'm trying to take it to colleges and universities and, and different places. So uh, uh, a few years ago, I had what was called Visual AIDS, and that was a showcase of films that dealt with the HIV and AIDS epidemic. Oh. And uh, we use that as a tool to open up discussion because basically uh, when you talk to an audience uh, about HIV and AIDS, they were either... Uh, here we go again, but they're either gay or AIDS act, act, activists, right? 
you don't you didn't really get the heterosexual audience in a room to talk about HIV and AIDS. And so we use the films to try and bring in a different audience to help open yeah. up that discussion. And so the same thing with Social Cinema Project. We're just gonna use these films to open up a discussion, get people in the room to talk about certain key topics, whether it's police brutality or the social, or the, I'm sorry, the justice system or uh, whatever the case may be. Or how, yeah. you know, what should you do when uh, you get pulled over by cops? You know, I um, just speaking on that, I had a real um, discussion online about the, the AIDS epidemic because I remember when it started out in the, uh, the, the 80s when I became aware of it. And it seemed like there wasn't a lot of education in the African-American community. It seemed like they purposely like did not like educate like about sharing needles and this and that and that and this. But right. anyway, <laughs> that's just what I, I found. But um, no, I mean, but that's that's the, exactly the point, because um, um, it was a white gay man's disease in the early 80s. And uh, they got their act together, even Africa got their act together in terms of uh, the pandemic that was happening. And, uh, but there was a time when uh, 75 to 80% of all new AIDS cases were uh, black women uh, between a certain age, I forgot what it was, but there were young black women who were the main cases of HIV and AIDS in the, in the uh, southeastern corridor of the United States. Mm. And um, so we felt like we had to do something to start raising awareness. So we, you know, we had uh, showcases at Howard. Uh, Howard would have these, uh, it was like a, a World AIDS Day, and they had a, uh, where you would do the rapid test. So what we did, we had the screening room set up, and they would go and take the first part of the rapid test, and then they'd go and watch some films, and we talk about certain issues, and they would forget to go back. <laughs> they didn't forget to go back to get <laughs> them. They were in there. We were only supposed to be in there for you know twenty minutes, and they would be in there. It's like, man, you're supposed to go back to class. It's like, man, well, we I couldn't leave, you know. Mm. So um, it was very, very powerful, and, and I hope we did a lot of good. We got, you know, because films will make you think about stuff. They will. You know I mean? They will. Yeah. You know, bring issues to the, the forefront. You know. Yeah, that you wouldn't even think about. Or when you see somebody else going through it, you can say, you know what. I need to go home and talk to my girlfriend about this stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah, you know. So how can people reach you? Um, I'm pretty sure you're going to put up a link or something. I have a website uh, that you could put up. Yes. Um, and I, uh, yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, I have a Facebook page. I have a, uh, as, as you know, I have a, uh, a group on Facebook called uh, Black Filmmakers Group. And awesome we're, group. I think, 15,000 strong at this point. It's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it gets tricky at some times. <laughs> people, get, people get a little out of hand, but it's okay. It's all, it's all good. Yeah, it's bound to happen. Well, hey, thank you, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I know you've been doing a lot of good stuff out there, and I always wanted to uh, connect with you and talk a little bit more about what you're doing, and I think this has been a perfect opportunity to do that. And uh, so, I'm sorry, where can we see Barbara's All again? That's going to be in the link you're going to provide. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to send it to you. I'm not, it's not uh, worldwide as of yet, but I'm going to oh, send okay. it to you. You can, you can make comments about it. People, if, if I wants to see it, they can reach me out. I might send it to them individually. You know, awesome. Know. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Hey, no problem. Take care. All right, guys. Bye. So that's it for this broadcast. And this has been Ron K. Armstrong, filmmaker extraordinaire. Until my next broadcast, if you've liked this one, like the video, subscribe to my channel. Until next broadcast, thank you and be passionate and pursue your dream. That's, that's something I think will work as a good saying. All right, take care. Bye-bye.